Welcome to the Mies Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, a culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, I'll be interviewing world-class entrepreneurs in the food space that are shifting the paradigm of how we innovate and operate in our industry. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Yo. They say art mirrors life with every stroke of the pencil. I'm giving you folks a glimpse into my experiences. You could trace like Welcome to part two of my fireside chat with Chef Wiley Dufresne. If you didn't check out part one, I recommend having a listen to that first. In part two, we finish our chat with some mm, not so quick, quick fire questions and some inspiring Q&A from the audience. We had a ton of fun and learned a lot, and I think you will too. Hope you enjoy. This podcast is brought to you by Mies, the culinary operating system for food professionals. As a chef and restaurant owner for the past 20 years, I was frustrated that the only technology that we had in the kitchen was financial or inventory software. Those are important, but they don't address the actual process of cooking, training, collaboration, and consistent execution. So I decided if it didn't exist, I'd do my best to get it built. So the current and next generation of culinary pros have a digital tool dedicated to their craft. If you're a chef, mixologist, operator, or generally if you manage recipes intended for professional kitchens, Mies is built just for you. Organize, share, prep, and scale your recipes like never before, and get laser-accurate food costs and nutrition analysis faster than you could imagine. Learn more at www.getmes.com. Well, we have a lot of questions from the audience, and I want to get to those, so I'm going to skip a couple things. I'm going to jump to a little quick fire. Okay. And then after that, we're going to do a bunch of q and I'll read some of your guys' questions, and then also just I can pass the mic around for anybody that wants to, to ask. And we might have Finn do another 20, 30 push-ups as well. Just um, a reminder, Finn was late today, guys, and we, we started late because of him. So quick fire. We got one, two, three, four, seven questions here. We're in New York. Um, so it's bagels, toasted or untoasted? Well, it depends on the time of day. Morning, you get your morning bagel. Toasted. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Fresh bagel? No, frozen. Wow. Yes. Okay. That surprises. Yes. yes. That's, that. Yes. A I'm toasted just raisin bagel with scallion cream cheese. Mm. Okay. Raisin and scallion. Hmm. Scooped? Scooped inside of it. Oh, oh yeah, take the bagel. The, the, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. Cinnamon raisin or just raisin? Raisin. Cinnamon raisin with scallion. Okay, got it. Yeah. All right. Favorite tech gadget, whether in the kitchen or not. My favorite tech. I mean, I, I've lately I've really come to like my remarkable. I know I talked to you about the remarkable. You guys know what that is? Yeah. Talk to me if you should. It's basically like a like a digital notepad um, that feels a lot like writing with a pen. It's like a stylus on steroids. Yeah. It's it's very simple. It's literally like a notepad that's digital. It it's not backlit. You it, in low light. You need light. But I decided to get rid of notebooks. We were cleaning out WD-50 and we had this orange room. It was called the orange room because the door was painted orange. And it had so much shit in it. It had like a, a plastic box full of notebooks in it. And I went to grab it and it was full of tiny little dots that I realized were the byproduct of cockroaches. Cockroaches poop and they leave dots, little dots everywhere. So the whole thing had been full of roaches. So I had to put the whole thing in the microwave because I didn't know what to do with it. I'm bad. So I put it in the microwave to sterilize it, and it sounded like I was making popcorn. It was kind of creepy. That's pretty disgusting. That's a good reason to get a... So I decided to go digital. You should, you should talk to Remarkable about an ad for, for them. Don't want cockroach poop? Get it Remarkable. Yeah. It doesn't have a great cover, so it's not great in the kitchen. It doesn't shut off, which is nice. Like, I, you know, your phone is great, but at some point, holding your phone, it, it turns off. My phone is waterproof because I'm an idiot and it's like the size of a sheet tray. Anyway, remarkable. All right. Or uh, a Y peeler. I think that's the other greatest invention of the last that 20, is, 25 I, I years, would, the Y peeler. You always look at someone like they're crazy when they're using not a Y peeler in the kitchen. Like, what are Anyone you doing? that uses, I, I mean, it's only, you have to be over 80 to not use a Y peeler. My mom does not use one. I think she's younger than that. Yeah, well, you just go to your parents' house. Yeah. I've given her like four still. Okay, Mary Lee, this is for you as well. Wiley, what's your favorite candy bar? 
It's funny. I don't fancy myself some of the sweet tooth, but I like candy bars a lot. I think one of my all-time favorites is the Sky Bar. Is anyone, everyone familiar oh, yeah. with the Sky Bar? Sky Bar's got five things, vanilla, caramel, fudge, peanut butter, and chocolate. Each one separate. Like a white wrapper? <laughs> it's white and yellow. The Sky Bar, I mean, economy candy. Yeah, you gotta go economy on the lower east, yeah. Economy candy on the lower east side. I would imagine the internet, because they'll bring you everything. The what? The internet. Tell us about that. <laughs> okay, most underrated food. This one I struggled with. I think there's a lot of things that are, that are underrated. Like, one I think that doesn't get a lot of play is edamame, soybeans. Like, I, like sure, go out for sushi, get a little thing of edamame to slot, but like, use them in things. They're great in things. We made ice cream out of them. We used to dehydrate them, chop them up in the food processor and dehydrate them, they, and then reconstitute them in the pan. They take on almost like a meaty texture. I feel like soybeans are they're underrated in some ways. I, it's also, I think, soy's in everything. Mm -hmm. That chair is made of soy, probably. But, <laughs> um, but it's like an ingredient that doesn't get a lot of respect. I was going through that one. There was a number of things. Granola, I think it's oddly under, even though that's also something that's all over the place. I don't think that people give enough attention and respect to granola. I like granola a lot, and it could be, it could yeah. be better. Tell us about American cheese. And your well, I was going to put that in there because I think that American cheese is a highly underrated ingredient. Tell you about it? What is there to tell? Why is American cheese so good, in your opinion? Who are you? I love it. It is what I, I agree. Yeah, where are we? What, what country are we in? Well, Sergio here is the biggest cheese snob you'll ever meet. He's also an encyclopedia of cheese. So, this is, so um, he obviously likes American cheese. Serge? I like American cheese in the right application, yes. I like it on a burger. He's crying right now inside. <laughs> uh, I was curious if we were talking about American-made cheese as a whole. As a whole. No, no, no. Craft we're talking American about processed cheese. American cheese. Well, re I yeah. mean, really, I would recommend Cooper's Sharp American. That is a fine American oh. cheese that I think you'd have a hard time saying doesn't have a place, particularly if you're from Phil the Philadelphia area. It's on everything. Mm-hmm. You get born and they wrap you in it. it but American honestly, cheese. American cheese, I like processed cheese. I had three pieces of laughing cow yesterday with a great smile on my face. That is delicious <laughs> because too. Because who doesn't like lavash kiri? It's mm -hmm. good stuff. It's t I mean, American cheese, like the way it melts, I mean, there's an, the engineering of that is pretty remarkable and it's pretty cool. I also find the technology very interesting. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, it's well, kind of based on fondue. It also, like, if your fondue breaks and you added American cheese to it, it will come back to life. <laughs> yeah. That's happened a few times. Yeah. I find it very, very enjoyable. I find it delicious. I can say that with full confidence, the one thing I eat every day is cheese. Wow. It's not always processed, but I probably don't. It's very rare that I go a day without cheese. Well, nowadays, is I'm sure. probably not great, mm. but. Nowadays, a lot more. I take more. a pill every day, so it's okay. Yeah. I don't know if I want to talk about raw tomatoes, but I kind of do. Okay. Uh, only because I still don't quite understand. Why I don't like tomatoes? Why you don't like raw? I think, don't you like cooked tomatoes and just They're not fine. raw? They're fine. They're okay. Why don't you like I raw tomatoes? Them. I generally try to stick to things that taste good. <laughs> so for me, it's texturally very off-putting. The seedy part, I don't know. Do you really think that's delicious? You really think that that like... Yeah. Snotty, seedy part is delicious. Yeah. Mm. Yes. yeah. And particularly when it comes together with mayonnaise. Mayonnaise and BLP. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I've always struggled with the texture. Like, I just, I just don't love it. I don't love well, do you, tomatoes. Do you I'm like gazpacho? Do I like gazpacho? I do like gazpacho. Okay. So it's a textural thing more than anything. Yeah. It's textually, I find it very off putting. Like, Look, I know that there's a thousand tomatoes out there and some sort of heirloom delicious tomato that actually tastes like a blueberry and it's da da da, da. And suddenly people start saying, this one's delicious because it tastes like this. I'm like, right, it doesn't taste like a tomato. It tastes like something more delicious than a tomato. So now I see where you're going. Okay. We're going to agree to disagree on this one. That's fine. I'm okay with that. Um, all right, let's move on. Best meal ever. I don't want to say that's a silly question because I like you, but that's, a, that's like, I can't put that down and say there was one meal that was Let's like see if we can having, filter you know, down dining more. at El Puli with my wife that was a great experience okay. you know I dined there four times but the time I ate there with my wife was great 
taking my dad to per se wearing shorts when you're not even supposed to do that. That was a lot of fun. You know, I enjoyed that. Okay, um, if you could go back and have one meal again that you had today. Oh, there's so many that I haven't had that I want to have. Okay, what's one of those? I wish I'd gone to Olivier Rollinger's restaurant before it closed. I wish I could have had Jared A's food before he passed away. You know, I wish I, I was this close to going to Manresa. Never been to Manresa in my life. Ooh. That's a major regret. That's a huge gap. Yeah. David is a lovely person, a iconic, legendary chef. I'm going to make it to Noma. I've made that promise to myself before it closes. It's going to come back in Japan, right? Isn't that? Well, but I'm going to make it to Copenhagen. Like that's, gotcha. that's my goal. Okay. I am so upset. I, I had a ticket to the Mexico event and I couldn't go because of my kid, which was a good reason. So I've never been to Noma either. Um, okay, moving on from that. Um, I love you, Stone. Funniest or dumbest thing you've ever seen in the kitchen? I mean, that one's, I mean, dumbest is like, I feel like it's tough to answer that without being a little bit cruel and making somebody feel bad. Like, as long as it's not about Kurt, we're, we're fine. You know, like, this is about to leave the kitchen. Chef comes over, grabs it. Chef, you can't send that to them. They have a nut allergy. It's a coconut. <laughs> now that, that's cruel. I think there's more like general funny moments. Like I think of our push-up rule, our blue tape. You guys know the blue tape. You guys incorporate that. Blue tape is painter's tape. I think there's a little bit of folklore around the tape was who started the tape, right? I don't think we know exactly who started the tape. But the idea that you know, we use cork containers in kitchens. It's sort of the universal vessel in many ways. We get tired of them going through the dishwasher with masking tape used to be the tape of choice for restaurants the world over. Masking tape goes through the dishwasher. The heat causes the glue to basically sort of fuse to the plastic in a way that you can never fully peel it off. And it's, it peels off, but then the glue is behind and it's sticky and it's gross and it's annoying. And somewhere along the way, somebody figured out that painter's tape, worst case scenario, it just comes off in the wash, right? It, or if it goes through the wash, you can just peel it off. But the tape in and of itself going in cork containers are then stacked upside down, put in the corner to drain and in a place where all the cooks can access them for whatever they need. It started to drive me nuts that you would go over there and there'd be tape all over the cork containers, even though they peel right off. Why is fucking tape on them? Why can't you remember to take the tape off before you put it in the dish pit? You have to walk from here to the dishwasher. While you're walking, pull the tape off. No, okay, if you leave the tape on, you owe me 10 push-ups. The tape disappeared so fast. <laughs> but there was a lot of humor around it too. And it was a great egalitarian moment because everybody left the tape on, everybody forgot in one way, shape, or form. And it was, everybody loved seeing the chef do push-ups. Everybody loved seeing everybody do push-ups because it was, again, it was not meant to insult you. Nobody... You know, I can't do push-ups. Can I do them on my knees? Sure. I can't do push-ups. Can I do jumping jacks? Sure. Just, you know, it, there was no moment where you were meant to be made fun of, right? Because cause it wasn't about that. And, and again, I think of those, there's so many funny moments. We had one guy who was training for an arm wrestling competition. So he took like 15 core containers and just threw them at the dishwasher all with the tape on them. <laughs> and that you know and so then he's doing 150 push-ups and turning red and he's all fired up and then the dishwashers would save them they would save the tape and they would wait till strategic moments and they would you know they'd come up at like you know it's 12 30 we're all done ready to go home hey chef chef mary mary owes you 10 push-ups <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that. You know? They can make people do stuff when they don't update their Asana board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there you go. Maria also upholds our HR, so as long as you're doing that, I think we're good. No, I'm no HR. I'm a, li I'm a liability. So, <laughs> I'm a, as you can see, I clearly am as well. But, you know, these are generic moments that I think, again, are part of team building, but there's a lot of humor associated yeah. around them. And I think that those are those are valuable moments. Like, I don't... There's a lot of funny things, a lot of goofy things. Like I started thinking, like I don't want to make fun of that person for in the heat of the moment thinking a coconut is a nut because that's mean. And it, it, yes, did we all have a chuckle at the time? Yes, but you know. Did you have the same rule if they didn't cut the tape and they ripped it? I was not into the the cutting of the tape. 
Now, I know that the spirit, again, that also is sort of, that's born out of Thomas Keller, right? The idea that instead of just tearing the tape, that you would then take a pair of scissors and cut the tape so that the, it was just so. And, and it was kind of silly that it became this whole thing about cutting the tape because it was as if, oh, no one knows that there are tape dispensers where you just tear the <laughs> tape and it's square. Became this whole thing about, <laughs> I cut the tape, and it's, as I cut the tape, I'm focusing my energy, and I'm becoming more serious about what I do, and I'm focused, and I take my job. They make fucking tape dispensers. You don't have to be so serious, mm -hmm. you know? So no, I wasn't, that wasn't, yeah. you know, an important thing. I would rather that you put the tape on there and label it, and, and then, you know, yeah. put hospital corners on the bed as long as you make it. You know, that's, that's, not, that's <laughs> not so important to me. All right, one more dumb quick fire question okay. for you. That you probably I haven't answered to. any of them quickly. As you can yeah. see, I'm a dis complete this is, disaster. This is, this is, it's like a quick fire story. Sorry. <laughs> this probably is a dumb question, and I don't know why I thought of it, but hypothetically, if you only had one fat to cook with for the rest of your career, duck fat, canola oil, grapeseed oil, any fat, and you could only use one fat to cook with, what would you use? Hair gel. No, butter. No question, butter. Oh, yeah, because you can clarify. Butter. Butter. That's a good one. All right. That's real good. I, sorry, I didn't mean to go out on a limb. <laughs> chef. That was good. This was amazing, Chef. Thank you so much. No, please. Um, I'd like, let's, let's, let's have some questions. Well, we from... have, yeah, we have a bunch of okay. Q&A. And I'm going to start it off from the audience. Why didn't you hire Gabe in 2004 <laughs> when he applied for a job? Gabe, you, you can add context if you'd like. Well, let me just put it this way. You weren't the only one. Did I dodge a bullet? <laughs> I mean, I, I can't possibly remember that. I'm sorry. I am sorry. We're hiring now. <laughs> I don't recall, Gabe. I, I, do, I do apologize. There were a lot of people involved. All right, that was more of a softball. But um, you had Dew's Donuts, uh, which were some of the best donuts I've ever had. Mostly cake donuts, and you started doing yeast donuts at the end. Lots of different flavors in Williamsburg. Was there ever a donut flavor that you thought was going to be a smashing hit, and it turns out it wasn't? And why? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, there were lots. I mean... Honey fennel was a flavor that I thought would be I like delicious. That. that was one of my favorite ones. Okay. You didn't buy 200 a day. I wasn't, a day, the, I wasn't, so the, I wasn't didn't, the audience. You didn't ask barely. me if it was good or not. You asked me if it was like honey fennel was one that didn't work out. Eggnog I thought was going to be a flavor that would be good. That kind of landed with a thud. We did a one that was a riff on a Manhattan. We did like a whiskey glaze with a cherry. We would often put two glazes on a donut. So we did whiskey and, and cherry. That one didn't really resonate. Yeah. No, I mean, I could go on. Okay. People are boring. That's they true. They want, most. you know, I mean, I say that obviously jokingly. I don't mean it that way. Vanilla is also my You're favorite. All boring. No, I mean, vanilla is my favorite ice cream. So there you go. It's also everyone's favorite donut. You know, people like pepperoni on a pizza. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Classics should be. I like the fact that there are classics. But, you know, again, I think it goes back to my sort of stubbornness about, well, I'm going to show people that donuts can be, you know, I was trying to solve a problem that didn't exist at times. And that was my problem. Uh. Well, I'm going to do an audible here just because we're talking about that. Um, you're opening a pizza restaurant and you've been for the last, I don't know how, how long, have been maniacally digging into every little detail about pizza and why are you opening a pizza restaurant? What is it about pizza that fascinates you and what are you trying to solve there? So cut me off if I make this story too long, but I was, the pandemic hit, my donut shop closed. I'm up in Connecticut with my wife and our two daughters and my wife's younger sister and her husband and their two kids. So we're in A-top and kids are being homeschooled. My wife's working from home. Her sister's working from home. The other husband is sort of helping homeschool his kids. I'm not doing a lot because the donut shop's closed. It seems like if someone has to feed the A-top, I'm the, probably the best choice of those eight. All, with all due respect, they all have, they're excellent at their respective careers. I'm down in the basement sometime in April of that year looking around and I, I, I come across, there's a pizza, the Breville Pizzaiolo oven sitting in a box. I had done some work for Star Chefs six months earlier and in lieu of cash, I took some gear, one of which was an espresso machine, which we're using every day. The other was the pizza oven. I said, well, that seems like a good way to feed eight people. Pizza's 
pretty popular universally. We we're feeding like four year olds and 50 year olds. So, boom, pizzas. One person's a vegetarian, two people are kind of picky. This pizza's perfect. Major caveat I don't know how to make pizza. Now, you know, I'd never really made it before. Sure, I'd done it for staff meal. I know how to make tomato sauce, this, that, the other thing. But I didn't really know how to make pizza, you know, ground up. So I did what anybody did. I Googled pizza dough. And, you know, that night I made pizza dough with the King Arthur recipe. And I was like, this is fine, but we can do better than that. And so I just, like, it, it, I was like, I need something to think about. I need something. So, like, there are a lot of awful stories about the pandemic. But I can say, for me, I feel very lucky. Like, pizza saved me. Pizza saved me during the pandemic. It gave me something to do. It gave me something to think about. Like I was helping my family, obviously carrying my weight as a, as a member of my family, which is the most important thing I could do. But I wasn't doing anything to stimulate my brain. And now suddenly I was. And as someone who wanted to understand the levers and what they are and how to work them, I didn't really have any problems with what to put on top of a pizza. That's where 28 years of being a cook comes in handy. But I didn't know how to make pizza dough well. I didn't understand the variables of pizza dough. So I bought, you know, 15 books, all the books that you would think and got on all the different forums and started reading and blah, blah, blah. So like learning how to make pizza became a little bit of an obsession. It's more like I fall down a rabbit hole happily. I'm happiest when I'm trying to figure that kind of stuff out. Like probably if I could get General Mills to pay me a lot of money to just be in a corner and figure out shit, that's really what I should have done. You know, I mean, I love restaurants and I would miss that part of it, but I love just figuring stuff out. I love understanding it and try to figure it out and tweak it and make it better. And so that's what I did. And I got to the point where the pandemic was ending. The donut shop wasn't going to come back. So I needed a job. I needed something to do. And I had been working with Breads, the owner of Breads Bakery, which is in Union Square. Uh, He had said to me, like, we'd love for you to do some sort of pop-up here. Like, we'd been trying pre-pandemic. We're going to do something with eggs. Then we're going to do something with donuts. And nothing stuck. So one day I said, how about pizza? And he said, you don't know how to make pizza. I said, wait a minute. And I live right around the corner from bread. So I went home and I made him a pizza and I brought it back. And it was an everything bagel pizza. So it was a white pie with everything bagel spices sprinkled on it. I gave it to him. He's like, that's not bad. I waited like two days and brought him another pizza. I was like, what do you, here's another pizza. He said, okay. And so we did like a six month pop-up of stretch making pizzas at breads. And, you know, I said to him, I said, I would like to continue. I'm going to now, I I think what I would like to do is I would like to figure out a way to open a pizzeria because I need, I need to know what's next for me. I don't have a what's next for me. And he said, well, I'd like to do it with you. So pizza was born. And so we've now, there's a group of us and we've got a space and it's under construction and there'll be a stretch pizza in March. That's awesome. And we have a, an office like two blocks away from there that we can visit on Park Avenue. Yeah. New Haven Pizza, Sally's or Pepper's? Zupardi's. I like Zupardi's. I think Zupardi's is my favorite. Yeah, I think their, their pizza is good. They're nice people. They're all nice people. I like, I like New Haven Pizza a lot. A lot of what I like about New Haven Pizza is the families, the communities. Like they're a nice, they're, they're just really good people like sometimes they can be a little gruff and some because they're dealing with high volume and all that but like i don't know new haven pizza is a it's always a pleasure to participate in because the people are always really friendly i've got to a point in my life where i only want to buy things from nice people i can buy olive oil from anyone i can buy a carrot from anyone i just want to buy things from people that are nice i want to try to be nice and buy things from people that are nice that's that's what i decided new haven pizza is always nice it's i like new haven pizza if you want to be treated poorly, go have Manhattan pizza. <laughs> you know, that's different. <laughs> As a time check, guys, we have about 20 minutes left. So I have questions from you, but if anybody wants to ask a question, just be proactive. So, yes, Vlad. How do you identify talent when you're looking at, you're meeting someone for the first time? What makes you buyers and your own? I suspect there's greatness standing in front of me. I carry a picture of Kurt in my wallet. <laughs> You know, I, I don't think I'm able to see that far down the road to say I see greatness. You know what I mean? I think that it's an old, you hear people say it, I just want someone with a good attitude. You know, I just want someone with, a, with the right attitude. I'd rather have somebody with the right attitude versus some, you know, old dog that doesn't want to learn new tricks. 
That's true. Although sometimes it's fun to get the old dog and help them see things and look through things in, in a new way. Like I, there's a lot of satisfaction out of taking someone who's stuck in their ways and have them realize that there might be a different way to do it. And I think that if you can explain that to people, I'm getting off track. It's, it, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know that you can see greatness, but you can certainly see potential. You know? And there have been people that I have bet heavily on and been wrong. And there are other people that I have completely underestimated and have beat me in a foot race. <laughs> you know, I think you try. The more you do it, the more you, uh, you, you, you probably get a little bit better at recognizing who's got the right mindset. But I tell you, there was a guy that worked for me the whole time at Dews who was really shy and really quiet and I thought was kind of just going to stay in his little donut lane forever and then Dews closed and I asked him to come help me at Stretch and he blossomed and he, he, I don't, see, that's not fair. He didn't blossom. It was always there and I didn't see it. I'm saying it the wrong way. I missed that this little guy in the corner was kind of just doing his own business was awesome. And he's going to come work with us at stretch and he's super excited. I'm excited. So I'm not giving you a good answer because I think, you know, people don't always show you their cards and you don't always read people. Right. I think you try to do the best you can. I haven't given you much. How often do you think you're right when you suspect it? I think I'm right more than I'm wrong, but you only have to bat 300 to get in the Hall of Fame. So that's not really a good number. (laughs) No. That's your only question now, Gabe. You lost your opportunity. (laughs) Ursula. What are kind of your qualifiers for knowing when to walk away? (sighs) That's very broad. That question is very broad. Walk away from... The project. I mean, sometimes, (laughs) sometimes I have to be told, like, you've done that enough times, you know? I'm somewhere around, like, 37 variations on my pizza dough, which, when you consider that I didn't know what I was doing, that's not a lot, right? Because if you don't know what you're doing, the first 20 don't count, right? But with the donut, I got to like 85. And at some point, I think I was starting to go crazy. And, and like, I was starting to look crazy. You know, the guys would come in and they're like, which recipe is it going to be today, chef? And, you know, that's when I was like, all right, you're like, really is a half a percentage of potato starch really going to make the, like, I, so that was helpful. That was them saying like, hey man, like, a, this is really hard that you change the recipe all the time. And B, come on, like, just please, please, just, it's great. You know what I mean? And, but I didn't have much else to do in the process. And so that's why I got sort of stuck. So I think sometimes you need other people to help you with that. And you need to be like a big enough adult to recognize that you're stuck on something. Donuts are different because you're looking for a function. You're looking for the base donut to behave a certain way. Whereas with a dish, how does it taste? Does it taste good? Do we all like it? Do a bunch of people like it? Is it balanced? Because it use more salt? Does it have enough acid? Once a dish is balanced, I think that's probably a good time to let your kid go to college and hope it does okay. You know what I mean? Finn. Being who you are, which is the person who brought something new to a place that didn't really have it. But when you started seeing people do it, how did it make you feel? I think that saying imitation is greatest form of flattery is 100% accurate. Like, I think that it makes you feel good when, if you're doing something that people want to copy, generally you're doing something right. You know, there was an instance of a chef in Australia who, uh, this was probably 2004, 2005. He opened a restaurant in Australia. He had come to, New- he'd come to America and he'd gone to Mini Bar, WD50, and Alinea. We don't know where else he went. But for sure, he went to those three places because he put dishes from those three restaurants on his menu verbatim. Now, that's tricky. Like, I would love to think that I can inspire people. That's a good feeling. Straight out copying without acknowledging. Like, if you're going to copy somebody, then you should acknowledge it. I mean, copywriting, food protection of food ideas is impossible, right? But Vanilla Ice is still stinging from some mistakes he's made, right? But we have no recourse other than, I mean, that was the beginning of like food forums and things like that. And so that guy got exposed for plagiarizing and did poorly for him. And I felt bad about that. But when confronted by it, he kind of stuck to his guns about what he was doing. So I still feel bad that it ended poorly for him. But I think that if percentages, xanthan gum, shrimp noodles, deep frying hollandaise, 
cooking grains and juices and any number of other ideas that were born out of WD-50 find their way into the mainstream, then that makes me feel that we were additive. All I wanted to do was for us to add to the conversation. I just hoped that we could be additive. That's really it. You know, to say we left it better than we found it implies that there was something wrong. We found it in a bad place. We didn't find the industry in a bad place. I mean, again, we're not talking about workplace toxicity. I'm talking about that. I'm talking about food on a plate. So I just hope that we added to the conversation, we added to the dialogue, and I believe that we did. And so if people are copying certain things, then, then I mean, I think that means we, were, we had some good ideas, and that would be my hope. I think the cool thing about it was it highlights why cooking is more than just art that's craft. Like, you can have any idea you want, but you have to technically understand, you know, you can sous vide a, you know, a piece of meat and cook a leek, but if you cut the meat you know, with the grain, if you don't know how to do that, it doesn't matter. All the other shit went out the window. And I think that's something that was highlighted when, after that, when everybody started doing more of those things, you saw a lot of, you know, restaurants pop up where they would just take the idea without knowing that there's 25 years of technique behind that and repetition on top of the idea. Yes. Agreed. A hundred percent. At the end of the day, really what I would hope is that the takeaway for Kurt or anyone else is more just how to think. Like, sure, you can take this technique or that technique if you want, but I feel better if your takeaway was a methodology, was an approach, was thinking about things differently, you know, because that will ultimately lead you down your own path. And all the weird, wacky shit that we did, that wasn't the point. That was part of the art. We were about knowledge. We were looking for information. What you do with that information is the next page in the book, but really we were looking for the information. We were looking to understand what was going on to food as we were cooking it. And that information is is equally valuable for the bistro chef on the corner who wants creamy mashed potatoes and bright green beans and a Bernays sauce that won't break and crispy moist chicken, right? You don't have to make foams and this and that and do all this wacky stuff to get at the core of what WD-50 was about. That was a subtext to the concept. We were looking for answers to information. We're looking to understand what was happening to our food as we prepared it so we could prepare it in a more informed way. There's no right or wrong way to cook. There's a more or less informed way to cook. And we were looking to be more informed about what we were doing. And that's the real takeaway for anybody. You come to WD-50, I don't care if you never make another whatever in your life, but you think about food in a more holistic way and you understand it a little bit better because What you do with it is totally up to you, but you have to understand what's happening to a piece of fish when it's in a pan or a chicken when it's in the oven or any number of other things in order to make them better. You can then decide you want to go off in this weird fantasy, or you can decide, I just want to make food that's not dry or food that's not bitter, you know. Can you talk about a time that you experienced burnout and what you did, not of a dish necessarily, but you... You know, it sounds kind of probably ridiculous or romantic to say, like, I, 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 loved, I loved every minute of it. I mean, I'd say that, like, I worked seven, the first seven years of WD-50, I worked six days a week. I was the only employee that worked six days a week. Everybody else worked five. Even my sous chef, who at one point was on six, said, can I go back to five? And after seven years of not going on vacation, I was definitely tired. And so I, I don't think I would use the word burnt out because burnt out, usually I associate with you getting to a point where you're no longer finding joy in it. When I'm burnt out, when someone says they're burnt out, I think that, that means they're done. They're done with that thing. I think of as burnt out. I never was done. I was just, I was tired. Now, little did I know that having a child would redefine tired. Um, <laughs> Because there's a picture of me sitting in the staircase of WD-50 with my head against the ladder. And that's 100% because I hadn't been asleep for like a day and a half because of my child. And that's, that, was, that was exhaustion. At a, I mean, children will teach you exhaustion in a way like you never thought of. So like, that's where I was. After, I, took a, I took a vacation. I took my first vacation in six, seven, six years and seven years, something like that. So that, that's where I was. I was tired, but not, 
not in a negative way, just like I need I need a minute to like. I think I mean more in terms of like ideation, like you're pumping ideas constantly. Is there ever a moment where you're like, I need to take a pause and just do for a minute so that I can refuel and pump more ideas? I think that I probably one of my shortcomings is I don't always perceive that. I would say if I look at, at myself in the mirror, like I sometimes am willing to bang my head against the, that window or that wall or whatever when I don't need to. I don't, I sometimes, you know, it's like the wind up toy that walks into the wall and doesn't know that it should stop. Like I am guilty of that. I would say that my wife is one of the best. I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons to love my wife, but her telling me, being good at saying, you know, you're hitting the wall like enough already. So that's a weakness of mine that I don't always recognize. I seem to have an innate ability. I think we all do. We can all be our own worst enemy, right? In any number of ways. I think I enjoy the tweaking so much that sometimes I do it to a fault. Thank you for pointing out my shortcomings. I got a question for for all about innovating on, on the food and the recipes. I was curious to what extent you ever innovated on the equipment. Some of your stories bordered on that, either to build or hack something that was in the kitchen or buying something for not its intended use, but getting a novel use out of it. I'm a big fan of using things not for their intended use or using things like, again, we've talked a lot about percentages. And this is not an equipment, but this I think fits your example. Like xanthan gum is an ingredient. I don't know if you're all familiar with it. If you're not, it's a it's basically, it's a thickener that doesn't need to be cooked. Flour is a, is a starch that needs to be cooked to thicken. Xanthan gum is just basically a bacteria that was scraped off of cabbage, kind of, and dried. And then you blend it with water at high velocity and it thickens things. And it, it's one of the most interesting ingredients in the whole world, I think. Why math is important is you use it at like total weight of a sauce. You use it at 0. 0.1, 0. 0.2, 0.3%. Beyond that, it starts to look like egg whites and get really ropey and snotty. So we put like 2% in coconut milk once because you're not supposed to do that. So that's all it takes for me to do it. So if someone says you should not do that, I'm game. I'm totally game. So we did it, put it in the blender. And because there's so much fat in coconut, no, if you did that with water, you'd probably fry the equipment because at some point it gets so thick that it, you're asking too much of the machine. But there's so much fat in coconut milk. It made this wonderfully weird textured thing. And we served it with crab meat. We put it in a pastry bag. We piped it across a bowl. And then we built all this crab on one side. Then we poured a soup on the other. And it was this weird white tube of coconut and a texture that coconut never lived in before. So it was this idea of like, okay, we're not supposed to do this, but let's try it. No one's going to get hurt. We have like seven blenders. So (laughs) back then, Vitamix was giving them to us for free. And it was fine. But there were also times when. We made some equipment that didn't exist. We had somebody make equipment for us. Dave Arnold, I know you know who Dave Arnold is. I don't know if too many of you know Dave Arnold is one of the great mixologists, bar people of the world. He's also my brother-in-law, and he happens to be an amazing builder, tinkerer of things. And uh, there's Alginate. You mentioned Alginate earlier. You know, the idea of Ferran Adria made the idea. He took a high school science experiment, which was... Alginate is also another gum that you can use to set liquids. And he famously took a high school experiment of blending alginate with something and dropping it into a bath of calcium chloride and alginate reacts with the calcium. And then let's say if you dropped mango out of a dropper into a a bath of water and calcium, because the calcium reacts with the alginate, you'd get these little, famously he made caviar of a thousand different things. But we wanted to get something inside of something. And so we needed to drop one flavor and another flavor at exactly the same time into a bath. And so Dave built a piece of machinery for us that would literally dose one at a time. And we dropped milk and coffee at the same way. And so we got a sphere of milk and coffee together. So we had coffee and a bite. And we rolled it in cocoa and coffee grounds and stuff. So you had this little tiny thing that was a bite. And it was this crazy Rube Goldberg machine that had all these things and blah, 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 blah. And it never went on the menu. 
you know what a peristaltic pump is? It's a pump that will just push liquid through it in a time. Was this might have been at the restaurant when you were there? It's just a pump that's used in hospitals a lot to pump liquid. It's a tube and you can dial it. And it just basically pushes liquid through it at a very systematic amount. So we uh, we also took coffee and we had it with pectin in it, and we were dropping coffee with pectin into a bath with calcium at a very dosed amount, and it, we had to figure out the distance. And we got it to hit the water and pancake on the surface. So after a while, you had this giant container. It would take hours. You just put it in the corner. You put one hose in a bucket of coffee, and the other hose was clamped above a bath at a certain height so that each one would pancake and then fall. When you harvest it out, it looked like a bowl of lentils, but it was coffee-flavored lentils. And we served that with a piece of foie gras. It was coffee. It was foie gras and lentils delicious so that's not at all what a peristaltic pump is used for but that kind of thing of like taking equipment and seeing what it does and then seeing what can we do with it and then there's other ideas of like seeing things and just completely doing them incorrectly like using an ingredient at a completely unthought of concentration level just to see what would happen awesome well we are right on time here and um jeff just thank you again i think uh I don't know about you guys, I'm super inspired and I hopefully everybody learned a little bit about how we can be more creative and curious and think outside the lines. And the big takeaway is be nice and buy things from nice people. Well, I, I, I want to thank you. You know, like I said, we've been friends a long time. I want to thank you guys for having me. I enjoy these kinds of conversations. I think it's fun to talk about what we did, what we'd still do. I mean, you know, I don't want to be 80 sitting around here talking about glory days with like Blue Springsteen playing in the background. There's a little (laughs) of that, but I do, I do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. I am a fan. I love what you guys are doing. I think it's super useful. We're, we're going to go deep with it at at Stretch. We're excited to dive in. We're grateful for that. So thank you all for having me. And when Stretch opens, we'll all be there. Maybe that's where our our next uh, team summit will be. Yeah. I mean, we look forward to having you guys again. It's good to see some old friends and meet some new folks. Awesome. Thank you, Chef. I hope it works out for you. Thanks, Chef. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning into the Mies Podcast. The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip-hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, visit getmes.com forward slash podcast. That's G-E-T-M-E-E-Z dot com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you can share it with your fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros and give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Keep innovating. Don't settle. Make today a little better than yesterday. And remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.